it should be soon. I didn't. By the way, I started recording. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't notice that there. Usually, when I do the check to just pull repos off of uh, from an organization, the but if I, you know, I start it within a day or two and the repos are all there. And so everything just works, but Comcast moved around about a dozen repos in the day or two between when I pulled the list of repos and started the analysis process. So it just, a uh, facades component doesn't handle things that it thinks are supposed to be there and then aren't very well. So I just caught that uh, middle of this week Everything it is past compact Comcast, so it shouldn't be shouldn't be past this weekend for everything to finish. Um, and I'll keep a closer eye on it now. I was at a conference and <clears throat> kind of didn't attend as carefully as I maybe ought to have to that initial process. I think I saw somewhere that that Comcast is sponsoring an open source like conference in in Denver uh, over the next couple of months. I, I thought, oh, that's interesting. That that sounds like something they might do. Because mm -hmm. their C, CTO, I don't know what her official title is, but she's on, actually she's given some talks mm -hmm. at the chaos events. So I think, she, I think they're, I mean, judging by the number of repositories they have, um, there's a lot. Now it's interesting, another thing that's interesting about Comcast's GitHub org is it contains an above average number of forks of things that they use. So um, when we do this, we may need to decide if we want to count those projects as inside of the Comcast ecosystem, because many of them are clearly forks of things that they use that are developed by other people. And some of them are like WebKit hasn't been updated in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So there are some, some aspects and I can go through and provide a list of the ones that are forks. Um, but there are some some aspects of the way that they're using GitHub that are different than how others are using it. And I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I'm saying we should be aware that, that some things that we say about Comcast looking at their repos probably has to take into account that factor. Right. Um, and that's just, they're just different than others that I've looked at before. Right. I mean, it's not like nobody has forks in their org, but it's it's few and far between. Um, and Comcast has a lot of forks. Oh. Sean, can you tell me what you're searching on these repositories for? So what Facade does, the, I mean, basically we substantially altered Facade at this point, but mm -hmm. what the core of Facade does is it just goes through a repo's commit log, and who committed it, and who, who authored it. So the author is the person who actually created the code and the committer is the person with commit rights to a repository. Often they're the same person, but sometimes they're not. And so we have information about which files were edited, how many lines were added, removed, and how much white space um, for each commit for each file. Um, right now, the default inside of the facade engine is to organize that by date. Um, I do have a version of facade that I'm working on that for the facade engine, I think I'll call it now, that I'm working on that will incorporate timestamps as well. Uh, okay. I've done one uh, group of 6,800 repos with that approach. The, the only thing that's broken there right now is the, the, develop, the generation of the cache tables have a dependency on matching dates. And so obviously when you do things by timestamps, you get basically no matches. So I have to go back through and figure out the right way to build the cache tables when I'm using timestamps. So the idea that, that will be hard, but I just have to do it. So the idea here is you're taking a look at files edited, lines added, removed for each commit for each file. Right. And then you're going to pull that data out into something. Some form. Yeah, that's yeah. And that's what Augur uses to um, produce like all of the, all the graphs on the Git page. Okay. And then from this output, is the intention to provide like hourly rate costs? Like what's the so, ultimate? So from, right, so from a, from a value perspective, um, the, the goal is to, I think, provide a, a way to do kind of hour, hourly rate calculations on the fly. Um, I have a, a spreadsheet that I've developed that's kind of the model that I'm using where essentially I put in a 
the labor rate and how I want to treat complexity, which is a multiplier. Okay. And I multiply um, lines of code by complexity by a factor for hourly rate and a factor for how I want to treat complexity. Now that needs to be refined. That's just using the numbers inside of the Kokomo model deployed by SCC. Okay. To put that on the front end instead of having it be something that's generated on the back. Okay. So there's really, how are you? Okay. So. And, and I think there's a lot of analysis that is going to have to happen contextually. Right. So none of this is going to stand alone. Like you can't run this and say, this group of, I think we've got like 2,500 projects. We, you know, you can't just apply a labor rate to all the projects, even inside of an org and make an estimate. You have to take into account various contextual clues. The, the ones that I think we can account for uh, best are, are ones related to essentially uh, standard multipliers for language used. Um, and then I think there's also a need to understand. Is this part of the complexity issue or is, is so complexity is, it does take into account the languages used. Okay. However, however, it is, I think also, it's also doing some analysis of the amount of branching, the size of the files, things that are generally accepted indicators of more complicated or complex software. Okay, so fundamentally though, the data that's coming out from these repositories around files edited, lines add, remove, for each commit and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you're then applying kind of a value perspective via labor rate and complexity issues. Right. And how complexity right. is determined has kind of quite a bit under the hood. Yes, quite a bit under the hood. And I think quite a bit that needs to be more, um, you know, SCC is a general tool that I think provides some utility for people. And we can use the output of that tool, which actually runs on a repository at a point in time, not on the commits. Mm -hmm. That can be applied to value added calculations for each commit. Okay. okay. Um, and so we can start to get trend lines um, that way. And I think once, once Andy, for example, is able to look at this and input some parameters, I think we're going to be in a better position to, um, I guess, get some feedback from, from Andy and, you know, I'll use it as well with some other people and, and try to understand okay. What are, the, what are the rules that we want to apply for a out of the box implementation? Well, what do you, do you parameterize the labor rate in certain components of complexity? The labor rate, the labor rate right now is, is an obvious parameter. The, the complexity is, I think has to be parameterized because it varies somewhat, I would say wildly um, from language to language. And I need to dig in a little bit more on, on that and build, build something that allows it to be parameterized. I think at the language level initially will give us much finer, that'll be like the sh smallest investment for the most, no, the biggest bang for the buck. It'll okay. be the small investment, but let us kind of create some kind of normalization for complexity by language. Okay. Um, and I can also give Andy access to a database that contains this information if he's interested in looking at that. Um, because sometimes if you, if you want to, which data? Well, like Andy mentioned JSON files the last time, and um, it'll be the data for the repos that we're generating for, okay. for the group of organizations that Andy and I identified, yep. uh, which include Ruby on Rails. I can just get the list. There's like no, that's fine. So I'm, you're just saying provide, provide um, access to really the raw data, which is the, yeah. the, the scan stuff that auger slash facade is doing. Exactly. And then on top of that, different parameters can be applied that can be used to derive value from these, the results that are in the raw data. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Like a spreadsheet person would go crazy with some of this stuff. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I could, I could see a spreadsheet person just going nuts with, with the raw spreadsheet data. person. I mean, you know, spreadsheets were designed for that, right? I mean, they're yeah. actually really good tools. Um, okay. Boring. Okay. Um, All right, that's helpful. Thing I got this down in the notes. That's why I was asking these questions. Okay. So, Sean, I think it's I think this idea of um, looking at uh, cost, you know, as a, as a function of code complexity is awesome, and it's it's really cool because it you know lends itself to 
sort of wide scale application mm -hmm. um, automated. And, you know, the other thing that kind of popped into my head is if you, if you had such a metric, and the other thing that I think would be interesting to organizations is to understand what their bench strength is, you know, across the whole code base. Mm -hmm. So you may have, um, let's say, just to, just in one repo, you, you may have a handful of developers, and it's it's possible that for a critical, you know, high complexity area of the code, you've only got one person, you know, who's making commits mm -hmm. uh, in that particular area, and and to me that would be an extreme risk factor. Yeah. You know, if you yeah. only had one, if you only had one person who who was the expert in one particular thing, especially if it's high complexity, difficult to understand. Uh, as a as a manager, that's something I'd want to know about. I mean, it would be pretty easy. I and mean, what I'm writing down is um, number of people who touched each file, mm -hmm. when they touched it, mm -hmm. and of course who they are. Mm -hmm. um, that would, and then you could just sort that by um, files with a lot of commits, only by one or two people, especially mm -hmm. in the last say year. Yeah. Um, those would be your higher risk areas. Right. Um, I think it's higher risk, especially if it's over the life of a file or a directory, which we could get to directory if we wanted to get fancy. Mm -hmm. um, if it's by the file or by the directory, then you know we could look at the life of it. And if it's a central piece of the code and has a small number of people over its entire life cycle, those probably be, <coughs> it's probably a, a more refined version of a bus factor than, than what's presently used. Right. right now we're just looking at, you know, how many people are a core to this repository, mm -hmm. not how many people are core to a, a part of the repository. And, and right. some of these repos are, are, as you allude, I think, pretty substantial. Oh, wait, oh without a doubt. So there's, our, there's dozens of people or hundreds of people in some cases working in these repos, um, many of them actively. And mm -hmm. if there's a piece of that that you know, that might show up with a low bus factor using standard uh, algorithms for bus factor, but if you've got a core section of it that depends on one or two people, then you have kind of a componentized version of bus factor, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. How do we know what a core section is? Um, so my, my, first, matter? my first swag at what is core would be things that have um, routine commits to them and are probably, you know, bigger files in general. So files or directories that are small with a lot of commits probably are less indicative of core and more indicative of small feature changes. Files that are larger in size and I mean, that would, that's a guess, right? Um, but it's a, it's a guess based on experience and heuristics that larger files and directories that, especially if they reference other files, Core could also be based on the number of different unique contributors. To apply. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's another that's another good instinct there. Um, although something can be core without a lot of unique contributors. Totally agree. But if your bus factor is really high, right? Then, or, I'm sorry, really, I guess really low is this one's bad. Yeah, then then you could have, but. But still, I think we're talking about heuristics, and that's as good as anything I've suggested. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can I can see where it would I can see in each case where there are reasons to be cautious about just using that one form of assessment. Um, what is, sorry, what is bus factor? I've never heard that term before. It's the number of developers on a project that can be hit by a bus without the project completely dying. So a bus factor of one is really bad. A bus factor of two, three, five, ten, those are all better. Higher numbers are better. It's the opposite of golf. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, you have projects that just, that's not even an issue. Like, you know, the Kubernetes is a giant outlier. And, you right. know, I don't think there's a bus factor there at all. There's a lot of institutional buy-in there. So what you want is high bus factor. Yeah. And also there's a corresponding element which requires the resolution of 
whom people work for, but elephant factor is the number of organizations contributing to a project. Mm -hmm. So like when you look at uh, repositories owned by really any tech company, in many cases like Facebook is this way, Twitter it's this way, Red Hat it's this way, most of the commits are coming from inside those organizations. Right. And so they have a, they might have a higher bus factor, but they have a low elephant factor, which um, I think is more an indicator, it's less an indicator of business risk, in my opinion, in many cases, and more an indicator of um, depth of community and community buy-in. So you can have something really useful, like uh, Twitter Bootstrap is a web framework that's very popular and has almost entirely Twitter dot com contributors and it's widely used so you can have something that has a low elephant factor and have it still be widely used same with uh, facebook's libraries that are now widely used so it's not necessarily indicative of anything that's negative in terms of business viability unlike bus factor which is well again in chaos we try to be agnostic on any value yeah yeah, it, there's always a there's always a, an edge case <laughs> where right. something is good and something is bad or it works here, but it doesn't work there. Yeah. I mean, when I think about the these these measurements that we can do, I, I, I think about Chaos Con last August and, you know, there is a desire for these red, yellow, mm -hmm. green dashboards. And they're hard to arrive at because there is so much context around all these projects. So okay. on the one hand, chaos is agnostic. And on the other hand, I think at least I, I have in one way, I think I have to talk about the ways that things could be used and the potential utility and also the potential lack of utility or the, I'm always concerned about, can this be misleading and how can it be misleading? Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we're starting to calculate things like value, the, there's a broader range for small tweaks and parameters to create um, really misleading statistics, uh, you know, so even within the organizations that we've cloned, I think we'll see different kinds of projects that we might want to instrument in different ways. Yeah. And I, th I think that's where the work that Vinod and I are doing right now, um, and Kevin actually, around genres of open source, uh, I think that's where that, some of that's going to have a lot of utility for chaos. Cool. Nice. I'll shut up now. Um, I have a couple other things. One is with respect to the metrics release. Does this working group plan on being part of the metrics release? I mean, I would like to. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, then there's work that needs to be done okay. in this regard. So, um, if you so here, here is the document. There's some mismatch that's going on. So this is the spreadsheet that we're using to track potential metrics. Mm -hmm. And these are the focus areas from value. And they're, they're not necessarily commensurate with one another. We need to probably start getting in line. If, if the working group is choosing to aim towards a release. I think it's important that we put a stake in the ground. Um, yeah. So then we need some work because right now we, we're around labor investment, but the metrics focus area in the repository has no deeper link. So we need a page around metrics investment. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And then within each one of these on the spreadsheet, commit count by organization or organization issue count by organization so on and so forth mm -hmm. we need the question that that metric answers goal question metric yep and then we need a detail page for each one of them um yeah i mean i just i mean i, I, I i'm not saying like you sean I mean, no, I know, but I mean, I have a, a stake in sort of defining metrics that align with things we can do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm thinking as a group here, we should probably spend the next two weeks trying to 
hone this in. Yep, to hammer this out because the goal is, is to get a kind of a first beta release of whichever metrics are coming from the working groups by by let's say the mid to late June time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um I mean even if there's just like three metrics that come out. Yeah. It's not it doesn't have to be all <laughs> across everything. No. no. So I mean so I we, Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Oh, uh could we pick three or four right now just to just to you know focus in and sort of cut down on, on the overhead? A hundred percent. So now I'm really excited about Kokomo. I'd like to see that be one. I mean, and uh, Kokomo is going to be essentially a, yeah, that's a cost. Yes, so we can do that. That's really. Labor cost. So I think when I think, when I think about all the things like labor cost and labor investment, like I said, those are going to be highly parameterized. And so there needs to be a, you know, I think I don't think we want to get in the business of, of. I mean, I guess we could get in the business of making standard estimates that people can modify, but I think we risk losing credibility if we provide things like hours and dollars without context. And but I so I think it's um, it's a metric that really requires the context of a user to make into a metric that has utility. Um, and that's different than the other things. I mean, we've made, we can count things like commits and issues and pull requests. We can provide a standard complexity measure. Um, we can do language breakdowns, but when it comes to things like investment, um, we're not, we're providing the raw material for people to use to create metrics that are relevant to them. Um, and so the on the fly modifiability of those estimates is, is so, important. So how about if um, we said uh, our metrics are going to be just the top four? And yeah. then, um, in addition to those top four metrics, you know, we'll um, have some way of exporting the JSON or the CSV, you know, into a spreadsheet and then you know, maybe maybe we could produce like a one-page guide saying, "Hey, yeah. you know, here's your version zero, you know, entry into the world of parameterized metrics. You know, you've got your CSV, you've got your spreadsheet. Here are some examples of things you might want to do to, mm -hmm. to you know, translate that into metrics." I think that's a good way to. I mean, that would be uh, that would be something that would be a good place to start, so that we're not making implicit claims in the tooling that that undermine the credibility of the tool. Uh -huh. So the way I look at these, the top four ending with Kokomo, those seem like they are what are being pulled as raw data by Augur slash facade or Augur and the facade engine. And the no. ones that start with the word labor feel like they're the ones that are then parameterized against that data. So SCC, the, the, the software that I'm using for the Kokomo, uh -huh. also does labor estimates and there are um, built-in there are built in values for the parameters that they use for standard parameters. And okay. um, so that's accessible and I said, that's accessible. I'm just skeptical about the standard parameters because it shows me some things that look a little wild. And so mm -hmm. I don't trust it. And right. Last one you were saying like auger is worth $9 million. It would cost to create auger. <laughs> I know that's wrong <laughs> or, or we are amazing. Uh, one or the other I'm leaning towards it being wrong. <laughs> well, I think it depends a lot on context. Okay. You've got Sean and in, in your world, you know, people who come with intrinsic motivation. And if you are in a corporate environment and you had to recreate what you've got with people who are just motivated by, you know, dollars and cents, 
Uh, very well could be that the cost would be high. Let's say if it was part of a government agency and you had to go and, and hire contractors or consultants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if I had to pay a standard market rate for building it, um, it certainly costs more to build than it has. Mm -hmm. But it's it's nowhere on the order of, I mean, my, my costs are probably a couple hundred grand. Right now, I mean, it's nowhere close to nine million. Right in terms of actual direct cost. So, so maybe that just highlights, yes, you know, uh, value is very con context dependent. Right. And um, so the idea of having a parameterized metric, you know, allows people to, you know, factor in their own situation. <laughs> yeah. We can and put, yeah. You are calculating this cost from your, like, own perspective, if you give the same thing to a third party or a software company to develop this entire system for you, I think it'll, it is going to cost you like maybe three times of what you have invested. I'm, I, I'm sure that's right. It's probably more than three times. Um, but I still don't think it's close to $9 million unless it's like a really, <laughs> a really bad consulting company. Like if I had a giant pot of money then an unlimited amount that I could spend, then I'm sure somebody could find a way to charge $9 million to build it. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, for example, if this is like, you know, for military where you, you can only do the work with people mm. who've got top secret clearances, then all of a sudden, boom, you know, yeah, all of a sudden it's probably closer to 20 million if I have right. to do it for, <clears throat> for them. Yeah, that's right. true. So can yeah. I make the following suggestion then? Yes. In the Spreadsheet, I just changed those top four to yellow. Do you see that? Yes. yes. Yellow indicates that we want to focus on advancing the metric for release. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so could I ask the following um, that one person, and then if you look at the, sorry, if you look at the notes that I have, the weekly minutes. I'll post it again here in the chat. So this Google Doc? Yes. We need to provide a labor investment page. So somebody needs to build this labor investment markdown page. So, so I'll take a I'll take a crack at it for us okay. to next week. And go ahead and just kind of follow the model for the one that's already there, living wage. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So just yeah. somebody needs to do that. So Andy will do that. I'm gonna put that Andy. Yeah. Put yeah. Me down. I also highlighted in yellow the ones that frankly we already have um, under different working groups. Um, yes. Uh, you know, you what did you highlight? Response time, number of forks and organizational users. Those are all. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I had living wage was chopped off at the bottom. Okay, sorry. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, those are gonna those come free with a uh, free with admission. You get a free drink. Um, okay. So and, with okay. So mm -hmm. then hold on a second. So then within labor investment, we need metrics and questions, and then Andy's gonna do that. Mm -hmm. I'm just writing those down. And then within each of those metrics, still on the labor investment page, we need somebody to start building out the detail pages for them. And I can do that. These are all, I mean, I can do, I can do first cuts at the detail pages. Yeah, right. Right. Cause we have a couple of weeks, even if it was just yeah. like a framework that we could hack through next week and the following week. Yeah. I'll put that in place in the value repo. Okay. Um, Okay, and then I guess for the um, living wage, Sean, as you mentioned, there are already three that are there. And actually, does living wage, do those map one-to-one? -to, -one? to the ones in other working groups? No, to the, to the repository. Response so, time is, rep um, well, you can map them to either a repository or a collection of repository you can i, don't I know. think i'm talking does it map just straight to this thing this thing i just put it in the chat okay i was just 
So to me, response no. to the number of forks and organizational users maps more to innovation value. No, hold on a second. I'm just trying to, so there's the spreadsheet, which the has living wage at the bottom with rows 25 through 34. The markdown definitely has different stuff. Well, maybe earning potential, object share, popularity, job, maybe not, average salary. Read them out loud and I'll just Commercial, commercial right. offerings, response time, number of forks, organizational use. Yeah, they map one to one. Okay, so then that's taken care of. That was my, yeah. that was my first issue. And then from, from there, Sean, you marked three. Yep, so I'll build the detail pages for those three and then yes. also yep. for the four at the top. Okay. And I'll just do first drafts. Um, okay. I think I think response time, although and number of forks, I'll, I think those may both have corresponding metrics inside of growth maturity and decline. And so I will look at growth maturity and declines definitions and and see if I if they exist as I think they do, with slightly different names. If I think that they are ostensibly the same metric, mm -hmm. um, and I'll make I'll make that point. Uh, and then we can discuss whether my assessment if it's of it being the same or not is is a consensus it it may not be like we may think of response time in a different way than the other working group and so then we would need to define our metric and probably reference the other one and identify a section for how they are distinct okay um, that would be my like guess because i I can see where we would call something the same and actually when we get to the details, sure. have it be exactly. different. Different, okay. And if the, if they are different, then just pick a different name. Is kind yeah. of your point, okay? Yeah, and I'll try to arrive. I'll try to deploy what we've used on evolution. Oh yeah, and if I mean, if they can cross, if it's the same thing, use it. Well, I mean, in, in naming conventions as well. So I may refine the the names for some of these things according to some kind of standard. Okay. Um, all right. For example. It, it, because this is in a markdown document, we reference it, we probably will have dashes instead of spaces. Oh, if, sure. if nothing else changes, that's likely to change in both places. Okay. Because that's a convention that's followed in a couple of, at least two, I think three, or possibly all four of the other working groups. Okay. And then I have, Okay, um, so what I understand is over the course of the next week, Andy's gonna make a labor investment page. Basically, you're just gonna make a labor investment page with the associated metrics. Yes. And then Sean's gonna make seven templates. Do you want a hand with that, Sean? I don't think I need one. I mean, I th I've done a lot of these before and I think I can I can put in a first draft and let you know when that's okay. ready, which would be before. So Sean's going to make seven, three of which are in um, living wage, four of which are in labor right. investment. And then just I put a future action item for me is when we go forward, I need to map these over to the metrics, the giant metrics repository. You know what I mean? But yeah, I'll, right. I'll do that once this all kind of. Right. Once this all kind of comes together. Settles a little bit. Exactly. I'm going to do it now. Um, okay. That's, that was my main issue. Yep. And then next week, can we just kind of have a hack session? I think that would be great. And also um, you'll have, I can guarantee you'll have auger stuff to look at before that as well. Okay. Okay. Anything else on that? Sean, would you like um, a Docker configuration for Augur? I mean, if you, like, are you wanting, so, I mean, I have Docker configurations. There's a Docker in the, in the Augur repo, probably needs to be updated. Okay. Um, but if you, uh, I think if you created an, uh, like if once I've got, if I could point you at a version and give you a Docker config, I think right now we're still, we're, I'm still doing something. I'm still half. I'm halfway in each world right now. Um, halfway in the new and halfway in the old. So, um, well, I I think for developers, um, the Docker is a big easy way to start. Well, 
I guess I was thinking that there might be two classes of users. One would be developers, and, and I think the Vagrant instructions you have would be great for developers. So they've got access to the whole environment, and it's just easier, in my experience, to yeah. to work direct with the tools. And then yeah. there, might be, there might be users, somebody who just wants to put up an instance of Augur. And for them, I think uh, Docker would be uh, an easier way to get going. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so so when I get hands on, uh, maybe that'll be one thing I can do to help with the software. Is mm -hmm. so, um, I'll look at the Docker config that's there and just test it out and yeah, try and run it and then. Yeah, I think the Docker config that's there is gonna. I've changed it up a few times, but I think it's gonna build off the master branch, which is still all the old stuff. Uh -huh. And there's nothing wrong with the old stuff. It's just not the new hotness. So. Mm -hmm. And Sean, in the last meeting, you said you are going to let us know when the Augur release is ready so we can test it and see if anything is, needs to be added in the readme for installation and setup. Yep. Uh, and I, I believe, I think you may have missed the very beginning of the call when I said that I had some issues yeah. with the Comcast repos not being there and okay. it got stuck on that because I didn't attend to it. I just assumed that everything was going to work because it usually does the first time through. Um, but Comcast moved around about a dozen repos, and when they're not there, then the facade engine chokes. I think was uh, is this related to a, a release of Augur though? Are these two different things? One is Augur running against the repos. One is a release of a new version of Augur. Um, when it comes to the Docker container, I think it comes to which branch you, that it should be built off of, and the the safest branch right now is still master because we've been working in a branch called broker and today we've moved all the broker stuff into dev so at some point in the next week because we the google summer of code students built out a ton of API endpoints for the data model mm -hmm. this week which is great and I, th I think my next step is to have them document those and write the tests and once that's in place then then i think we can move a bunch of it over to master okay um and and yeah. Yeah. Right, and then try to move things off of, essentially when I release the master, I wanna be done with the old, the old databases that we use other than a, a shared, shared access to an instance of GH torrent so that people have that functionality still. That's the only, I guess, relic of the original Augur that's gonna stay there just because there are useful endpoints that people use um, and useful front end graphics that people use. Um, to do comparisons with any GitHub repo. And so I think we'll keep that alive, but not make it part of our deployment, make it something that people just get access to a shared um, GH torrent database that they can access. And if it starts to become a problem with performance, then I'll, I'll solve that later. But right now that's- When is your next release, do you think? Um, Safely by June fifteenth, um, shooting for sooner. Okay, so I think that's what you were asking, Vinod. Yeah, like probably. Just, just when the release is, so that. So I think I think for what Vinod's doing, I, I think I can have him run across a version of the README um, before that out of the dev branch. Okay. Um, I'll just have you work in dev, Vinod, because it would be good to harden that that documentation ahead of a release. Right. Okay. So I had just a little bit of feedback um, marketing wise. Uh, when you do a Google search for the word Augur or it Augur software. Up, the blockchain um, people come up. The blockchain people. Um, maybe it would be helpful to refer to the project as Augur metrics and then, you know, tweak the, the homepage. So it, you know, if people are trained to, Look for Augur metrics, maybe that would be helpful. That's a good suggestion. I mean, we're certainly, you know, it's like they came up with their name like two weeks before we came up with ours and we had no way of, I mean, we probably should, we were aware of it. We probably just should have gone with something else, but it took my team so long to come up with a name they all agreed on <laughs> that I didn't want to, I just went with it, which I think in hindsight is a marketing error. Well, it's a, it's a, so Augur metrics is a good suggestion, actually, a way of keeping the Augur quote unquote brand, but 
um, make it easier to find in a Google search. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that. No. Um, I had one last thing, just, it's more of just an FYI, um, from a code of conduct within each of the repositories. I know that value has a code of conduct, but I think we're going to move forward to just have one central code of conduct. And I can, I, I agree. And I can make the same, I have been making that change in the, the common repo. So I could make the same change when I do the edits to ours. If you want. If everybody yeah. Wants. I mean, it's just, it's just basically what it's going to come down to Andy is the code of conduct document will still be in the value repository. It'll still be there that markdown file. But it'll just be, instead of the actual full code of conduct, it'll just be a small link that says, here's the code of conduct. Please click here sure. to go see it. That way we don't have like 400 codes of conduct across all repositories. And if, if we do a small tweak to the overall chaos code of conduct, you know how that goes. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that's, that's smart. Okay, so just FYI, that's happening in the repos. Uh, thank you guys very much. Yeah, you didn't think there was anything to talk about. What the heck? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, give a give a bunch of software developers and or academic space to talk, and we might. Fill it. <laughs> <laughs> Poof. Yeah. 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 Yeah, All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.